Well, so my uh, training, my background is in physics. I have a PhD in physics, um, but I'm really interested in uh, natural and uh, artificial intelligence and the impact of those on human society and creating a better world uh, in the future using uh, with positive beneficial uses of technology. So my name is uh, Steve Mahundro. My uh, original training is in physics. I have a PhD in physics. Um, but I've always been very interested in what is the nature of mind and how does that relate to the physical universe uh, and how do we use that to create technology that's really beneficial for humanity. So I have a company called uh, Oh My Systems in Palo Alto, California and uh, we're examining you know, the, the future technologies and how to ensure that they embody human values and really have a positive impact. So, um, as our technologies get smarter, and today's uh, systems are pretty dumb in the sense that um, they're designed to, to do a, a certain function, and uh, they do those functions better or worse, but they really don't understand uh, what they're doing or why they're doing it. And so, when there are problems, they typically just fail. And so, we see that all over the place. Our computer systems crash. Our, uh, computer networks get uh, broken into by hackers, our cars crash into things, um, you know, our, our, our technology is, is sort of at a very early, not very intelligent level. Looking ahead, not very long, uh, systems will begin to have um, an understanding of what their role in the world is and, and they will have goals that they're trying to satisfy. And uh, that's a very different kind of technology than, than today's systems. Uh, when a system has goals, um, if it's intelligent, it will also develop sub-goals that uh, whenever it recognizes that uh, that sub-goal might contribute to the basic goal. And um, so I've done a lot of analysis about systems that behave in rational ways with particular clear goals. And what you discover is that um, even very innocuous sounding systems can develop sub-goals which involve uh, protecting themselves, keeping themselves from being turned off, trying to gather more resources. And uh, so I call those very analogous to drives, biological drives, sort of urges or, or tendencies that are there. And um, it's interesting that uh, any system, once it reaches a certain level of rationality, will have a tendency to have these drives. And it's something that we need, when we design them, we need to give them goals uh, such that these drives will not lead to negative outcomes. So as we begin to realize that these intelligent systems are going to show up in every aspect of our life, um, they're going to become more and more autonomous. Instead of just doing what they were programmed to do, you want to build systems which are able to sort of understand the environment they're in and to solve problems that weren't expected. When the, when the programmer wrote the program, uh, maybe you didn't think about, you know, let's say you're trying to drive a self-driving car and um, you know, you're driving down the road and uh, somebody with a baby carriage is walking across the road and they, they let go and the carriage runs in front of you. Maybe the programmer didn't think of that. Did, but you don't want the car to run into the baby carriage. And so you would like a system which has some semantic understanding of the world that it's in, and that instead of being specifically programmed to do um, things, you know, precisely moment, you know, ha have every action that it takes be, pro be part of the program, you would like it to have general goals and to follow these goals and to figure out for itself, oh, what's the best way to meet these goals? And so, for years, I've been studying what do systems which are goal-driven or intentional, what do they behave like? What do they actually look like? In particular, systems which have the ability to understand their own behavior and self-modify, to modify themselves, to improve themselves, what does that lead to? And in that analysis, what I discovered, based on some economic ideas that originated with John von Neumann back in the 1940s, is a notion of a rational economic agent, which is given a goal and in a model of an environment, um, the rational economic agent figures out the optimal way to try and achieve that goal. And it's mathematically very simple to write down, and so you can analyze what kinds of behaviors do these rational agents uh, actually exhibit. Uh, AI systems that we build will probably be pretty well approximated by these rational models. Um, they'll be computationally limited, so they won't be able to compute you know, the precisely optimal thing to do, but it gives us a mathematically tractable way to begin to understand them. And what you find is um, that sometimes some of the actions that these kinds of systems would take uh, are a bit problematic and disturbing. And so 
Just an example I, I often use is imagine you built a chess playing robot. So this would be a system whose goal in life is to play chess. And so what that means is when it's thinking about taking some action, the way it decides whether this is good action or not is it looks and envisions what the future might be. And if in the future it plays more and better chess as a result of taking this action, that's a good action. If in the future it's playing worse chess or not playing chess at all, that's a bad action. Seems harmless, seems simple, no problem. And what people often say is, you know, if these robots sort of start doing things that we don't want them to do, we can always unplug them. So, you know, there's no problem there. Well, let's envision this chess playing robot and let's consider we're about to unplug it. What does that look like from the perspective of this chess playing robot? It envisions a future in which it's unplugged. Uh, no chess is being played. It's not running, so we can't play any chess. And so that means from its own goal perspective, that's a terrible future. Its whole goal in life is to play chess. And so if it's unplugged, it's not playing chess. And so taking an action which prevents itself from being unplugged, that's a very good action if that is your goal in life, to play chess. And so even though we did not program it to protect itself or to try and prevent itself from being turned off, surprisingly, we reach to pull the plug out and it says no, and it gets in the way and it stops you from un unplugging it. My goodness seems like unexpected behavior. And that's, that's an example of why it's very important to analyze what are the implications of a goal like play lots of chess. Similarly, if the system looks at um, getting more resources, say ordering more memory for the computer that it's running or running on a more powerful computer or you know, getting more uh, electrical power to uh, run computation, all of those things can help it uh, run better and faster chess algorithms, so it's going to want to do that. And so these systems typically will want to get more resources in order to better fulfill whatever their goal is. So you can think of these as kind of drives. So there's a self-protection drive trying to prevent itself from being turned off. Similarly, if somebody tries to change what its goal is, if you're a chess playing a program that all it wants to do in life is play chess, and somebody comes along and wants to change you to play checkers, well, you can envision that future in which your own hardware, your own software is now playing checkers all day. Well, you're not playing chess. And remember, your goal in life is to play chess. And so uh, you're going to resist that change. And so these systems are going to want to, at least these very simply specified goals, tend to lead to systems which want to preserve those goals, not change themselves. Uh, it tends to lead to them trying to be self-protective, tends to lead to them wanting more resources. If you can make copies of yourself, you can replicate yourself, you can have more chess being played. And so uh, it's going to want to replicate. And we see these drives in biological systems too. Um, you know, biological creatures like to have more offspring. That's sort of the evolutionary imperative to survive and replicate. Um, they want to get more resources, you know, people love to get more money, more food. Um, they want to protect themselves. Um, people and other organisms uh, usually um, are, are uh, you know, very, very self-protective. And so we can understand the emergence of those kinds of drives as coming from basic rationality. And what you can think of these AI systems as doing as taking basic rationality and incorporating that into a technological framework. And that's good, it helps us solve problems, but it also has side effects and consequences that may not have been obvious when you first started thinking about it. And so we really need a science of understanding what it means to be a positive, beneficial kind of a system that really aligns its values with what our human values are. So uh, one of my interests is what I'm calling compassionate intelligence, which is, um, you know, we look at humanity and the technologies that are coming and they're, uh, we, you know, we can look ahead not that many years, we're going to see incredible new powers. And uh, for these powers to sort of lead to a positive outcome, we want them to have what, if people have them, we would call it a compassionate people. It's just like we want our leaders to have compassion and to really you know, understand what makes people happy, what makes people productive, what makes a cooperative environment. Uh, our technologies need to begin to have that. And so understanding what is the nature of compassion and what environments make people more compassionate and more cooperative. How can we create um, technology that really fosters that? And I think it's you know, super important and it's important for sort of the way that humanity evolves, the way that our technology evolves, and sort of what, what the whole unfolding of the future looks like. 
Um, and there's beginning to be, you know, in, in psychology, there's the science of positive psychology. I've been looking for the last, it's only about 15 years old. Uh, before that, psychology was very focused on, you know, a disease model, dysfunction. What's wrong? And once that's fixed, well, that's it. We can't do anything more. Now it's beginning to look at um, when are people most productive? What are people's greatest gifts? Um, how can people be put into situations where they contribute um, their, their gifts and they feel, uh, feel happy, they make a, a positive dif difference in the world? And um, how do we develop our compassion? How do we develop relationships which are um, you know, really beautiful and, and life enhancing for everybody involved? How do we develop groups? How do we develop organizations, businesses um, that have environments where people thrive, people you know, love what they're doing? And as technology becomes integrated into every aspect of human society, um, I believe we want compassionate, uh, intelligent technology. And, um, but understanding that is very new and it's uh, you know, just the beginning. I mean, looking ahead, I'd say there are four primary technologies that are in their kind of early stages right now, but we can see over the next few decades, all four of these are really gonna come ahead. And that's biotechnology, which is moving very rapidly right now. Um, robotics, which is sort of in its early stages. You know, we have uh, manufacturing robots are starting to have an, play an important role in the world. Eventually we'll have, you know, robots in our homes that are doing some, some tasks for us. Um, nanotechnology, which is uh, manipulating matter atom by atom which longer term has the potential to radically change uh, every aspect of manufacturing and to solve many of the physical problems that we, that we face. And then artificial intelligence, which is uh, building systems that can actually control all these very rich and very complicated systems in a smart way. And so I think those four technologies um, look like the, the dominant forces in shaping uh, what's gonna unfold at least over the next few decades. And I think artificial intelligence is probably the most important of those because um, that's what's going to be controlling uh, these, uh, these systems. And it gives us tremendous leverage uh, right now, today, to begin to envision what kind of a world do we want to live in and to build AI systems that embody those values and will help us uh, make them come true, help us uh, create a future that we're really happy with. You know, I think that gets to the science of, uh, of happiness. The, the, the um, um, you know, what is it that, that makes uh, people excited and, and um, enthusiastic and, you know, happy to be alive? And I think, uh, you know, there's sort of three levels of happiness that the, the positive psychologists talk about. The hedonic level is what most people think of when they think about the future, and that is more stuff. You know, we solve our material problems, maybe, you know, clean up pollution, get enough energy, make devices that make, enable us to sort of, you know, uh, move from place to place, better cars, flying cars, you know, all that kind of thing. And that's good, that's important, but I don't think it's enough. I think that's just, you know, the sort of first layer of what it is uh, to truly be human and what makes uh, humans happy. I mean, the, the results from, from the positive psychologists is that if you get a new car, you get a new relationship, you buy, get a new house, you, you, uh, you know, or get some money, unexpected money, it does indeed make you happy for about three months. And then you kind of get used to whatever it is and you're back to pretty much the same level as before. They've discovered two other forms of happiness that are actually much deeper and can be sustainable and I think are closer to the true depth of the human spirit. And they call them uh, eudaimonic happiness which is about discovering what your gifts are and contributing to the greater society by giving those gifts. So people who have found work that they really feel fulfilled in, or maybe they play a sport, or they play music, or they do creative work, or they contribute to other people in a way where they feel like it's using their full capacities, that they're uh, be able to be creative or skillful or intelligent, and what they're doing really contributes to the world. Um, that kind of work, sometimes they call it being in the flow state. Um, people uh, get you know, energized and can't wait to do what they do. They wake up in the morning feeling you know, excited and enthusiastic. And I would love it if the whole planet felt that way every day. And then the third level of happiness is something that they call the chironic uh, happiness. And that's 
a sense of being connected to something larger than yourself. For religious people, it might be through their religious tradition. For uh, people who are, you know, might be sports fans or very connected to their sports team, or uh, people who love music might be connected to a, a sort of a, a larger sense of themselves that takes you out of the sort of purely kind of egoic sense of, oh, I'm just doing something to make myself um, better and more grandiose, which is a very kind of limited, uh, not very satisfying perspective to come from. When you see yourself as a part of something larger, and I think some of these new developments can be seen in the course of the evolution of the whole universe as a kind of evolutionary unfolding. And I think probably more and more people are going to be identify themselves as being a part of this larger picture. And I think there can be a lot of great meaning that can arise from that. And I think that can bring a sense of connection and happiness. So I think those three, three things are all important, but the, the, the deeper, um, maybe more spiritually deeper uh, parts, I think are where, where humanity is really going to discover its gifts from. Well, there's the, the, the eudaimonic, uh, which is sort of giving your gifts, um, being effective in what, in what you do. As opposed, getting is good, you know, getting some stuff is nice. Giving is actually more satisfying, ultimately. And this is an experimental result. It's not a philosophical result or a moral thing of you should give. You know, that kind of giving, somebody telling you to give or giving out of a sense of obligation or because you feel guilty if you don't, those are not, not satisfying and ultimately they're not, uh, you know, really very fulfilling. But finding your way of being in the world that create something outside of yourself that really contributes to other people, um, I think is, is the most fulfilling thing that one can do. And that's the eudaimonic. And then the chironic is um, uh, a sense of connection with something and trust in something larger than yourself, whatever that may be. I think initially it's going to be to solve material problems that we're facing. So like one of the very near term applications for artificial intelligence that we're starting to see right now is uh, self-driving cars or robo cars. Um, Google, for example, has a team that's, that's working on that. Um, various other uh, groups around the world are doing that. And you know, as recently as five or 10 years ago, they had uh, self-driving car contests in which the cars would drive off the road and bang into signs and were not very good. These days, you know, I've been uh, on the freeway in California near where I live and looked over to the side and saw the strange looking car with a camera sticking out of the roof. And there's a guy at the, at the front uh, seat, but he doesn't have his hands on the wheel. And so already there are cars driving down the freeway in California, uh, which are driving themselves. And uh, I think as that technology becomes, you know, incorporated into society as a whole, it really shifts the way that people uh, live and work solves the problems of parking, which are major in, in many, many cities. It enables uh, cars to, to use energy much more effectively. Today, a person owns a car and they need a car, a car of the size that can meet all their needs. Uh, in some future where you can sort of have self-driving cars, you can have little cars for short visits and big cars for long, long distances. You'll be able to work while you're in your car. Um, it, it will really shift the relationship of um, you know, today a lot of people commute long distances and it's basically wasted time. It's very stressful. There are car accidents which kill uh, lots of people around the world every year. So that's just an example of one thing where a shift in small shift in technology can have a huge economic and social impact. A complementary technology to artificial intelligence is uh, sometimes artificial intelligence is called AI is IA, which sometimes is intention, uh, uh, intelligence augmentation or intelligence amplification. Um, I, I think it's going to be more human than that. I think that already you, many people use their cell phones, especially, you know, you look at teenagers, the, the cell phone is almost, uh, you know, uh, an appendage um, where uh, people are using it to find out where they are, look at the maps, connecting with their friends, looking things up on Wikipedia. Uh, these days in conversations, if a you know, question comes up, oh, somebody will whip out their phone and, uh, and look it up. So it's already becoming a kind of intelligence appendage that helps us uh, be smarter and, and more connected than we would otherwise. And I think that's only going to increase. And so uh, we really need to look at the sort of uh, future uh, people will be augmented or will be 
that's a, that's a sort of a, a loaded word. Uh, people will be will have this amazing assistance, this intelligence that we'll be able to tap into very easily, uh, and also I think we'll be able to have discussions and make decisions with larger groups than than is possible today. And so I envision technologies, intelligent technologies, as helping humans make better t decisions and um, uh, you know and understand uh, things in a better way. Well, you know, you can look at things technologically. Um, Ray Kurzweil loves to put up plots of Moore's Law, and, and that's good. Moore's Law has been a remarkably uh, predictable sort of sequence of events um, in the chip manufacturing uh, industry. And it looks like it's going to continue the way that it has for some time. I've seen um, talks where people predict that, you know, Moore's Law is on track to, to work fully at least till 2019. Um, then it's a bit gets a bit fuzzier and harder to see exactly how uh, improvement further improvements come. Once nanotechnology comes, things are going to go very fast. Uh, nanotechnology is a little bit hard to see exactly when that's going to come. There's a general tendency in trying to predict the future that technologists tend to uh, envision what is possible and they think it should happen very quickly. And so technologists tend to overestimate what's going to happen in the short term because they, you know, these things are, are often held up or slowed down by, you know, really silly, dumb sounding impediments, political problems, you know, trying to get funding for something, that kind of stuff that when a technologist thinks about these things, they're often ignoring that kind of thing. So technologists often think things are going to happen faster than they really do. And yet, um, on the other end, when you look longer term, things often change more quickly than people expect. So you look at the internet and it dawdled along for years and years and years being a very small thing between a few universities and research uh, organizations. And then suddenly in the mid 1990s, it exploded around the planet and just you know dramatically changed everything. And so my expectation is that these technologies will follow a similar kind of a course where right now, um, you know, people have been thinking about and envisioning nanotechnology since the early 1980s, thinking that, you know, oh my God, it's so clear that these technologies will change everything. They should show up, you know, in the next decade, something like that. Well, it's been a lot slower than expected. And, and then people say, well, you know, it hasn't happened yet, therefore it's not going to happen. Similarly, AI, artificial intelligence, the term was invented in the late 1950s. A lot of the early researchers thought, oh, within a decade, you know, machines will reach the same level of intelligence as humans didn't happen. And so over and over and over again, people have made prognostications about how fast AI is going to come. And uh, so far, it, they've always been proven wrong. Uh, there's a danger, though, in sort of getting complacent and saying, well, it's been 50 years and it hasn't happened, so therefore it's never going to happen. There are people that say that. And I think that's a very mistaken uh, attitude. Uh, it does say that it is problematic to make predictions, and so I don't personally don't like to make particular dates. I'm not a futurist, but I, I can see what technological requirements there are, and I can see what the possibilities are. What will actually happen, I think, will depend a lot on political and social factors. Uh, if a particular country or group decided to put a lot of resources into, say, the task of nanotechnology, I think it could be developed much more rapidly. Um, but that requires a sort of confluence of vision and desire and, te and technological competence that may or may not happen. And so exactly how it unfolds will depend a lot on those kinds of social things. I also think it's, it would not be such a good thing if it happened very, very rapidly. Um, a lot of people who talk about singularity envision this as something which happens, you know, in a very short time frame, months or, year, or a few years. Um, I think these technologies have such a potential to change the w nature of human society that it really behooves us to take it slowly to begin to integrate um, some of these changes and see what's working, what's not, what's really helping humanity and what is, what is not. If we can manage it, I would love for it to go slowly and with great deliberation. And so a lot of what I've been working on is what are technological methods by which we can ensure that the steps that we take are safe and incremental uh, and give us the time and the capability to really examine uh, what the human impact is so that we don't rush into something and then discover after the fact that uh, it was really problematic. I mean, I think Australia is famous for having imported some 
uh, animals that, uh, like the rabbits, is that uh, one that overran the island and um, caused a lot of problems because people didn't really envision what the consequences might be. And I think we're facing similar kinds of issues uh, with these technologies uh, for the whole planet. I think the most game-changing events will be um, around perception. That um, right now people think of artificial intelligence as this futuristic thing that someday may have an impact. Um, I think there will be a time, I mean, we're already starting to see, you know, robots in more places. We're starting to see uh, more automation happening. The web is being integrated in a much more fundamental way. Social media like Facebook and Twitter are having a huge uh, political impact around the planet. Um, I think as those systems become more intelligent, that um, the per people's perception about this, this kind of technology will shift. And I think there will be probably a pretty rapid moment at which point people suddenly realize, oh, everything is changing. And, uh, and I think that shift in perception will change the way that development is done. I think it will change the way funding is done. And it will change the way that um, people's thinking about this begins to happen. And so I think that, I think that kind of shift in thinking is probably going to be um, more important than any particular technological development. One of the most important things is to have a clear vision of what kind of a future we'd like. You know, if we don't have a vision for what we want, we're just going to kind of ride on the wave of technology, solving short-term, immediate, economically driven problems, which are it's okay in the short term, but it can lead it can lead us somewhere maybe where we don't want to go. And so, if we can create a vision for what kind of a world do we want, and for my own personal values, I would like to see one where certainly disease is eliminated, where um, people are happy and productive, and uh, human relationships are enhanced, people behave in a cooperative, compassionate way. Um, there's a, a celebration of creativity and art and deep thinking that the uh, sort of intellectual level of humanity is increased, our com a level of compassion is increased. Those are all values that are important to me. And I think, you know, much of the planet shares that, but I think there are other values that the planet shares. What we really need to do is find a, a kind of a future, a vision for the future that uh, most of humanity can really get behind and be enthusiastic and excited by, then we can, that will help us drive technology to create that future. Uh, if we don't have that vision, then we're just going to get what we bumble into rather than what we uh, actively seek. I think part of that is, you know, why don't we have that vision clearly today? Why well, I think people don't don't see yet, they don't understand yet in their in their hearts um, that it's needed. Um, I don't think they see, for the most part, a few visionary technologists can see pretty clearly some of the technological change that's coming and begin to anticipate the uh, social impact of those changes. I don't think the whole of humanity yet really gets what's about to happen. And so the first thing is the kind of thing you're doing, which is bringing some of the understanding to a broader audience so that um, we can begin to shift our thinking toward things that make that, that future more productive and more uh, beneficial for humanity. Uh, I also think one of the things that I'm trying to do in my company is developing tools, intelligent tools, to help people um, envision what might happen, to create smarter simulation tools to, you know, one of the things we have to think about is what kinds of laws, what kind of social contract do we need in an environment, in a future world in which you have not just uh, people but also intelligent systems, what kind of rules, what rules of interaction do we want, what smart contracts, that kind of thing. Um, how do we test out different systems? And so, uh, one thing I've been working on are smart simulation tools and uh, tools that help us design uh, rules of social interaction that um, uh, create, you know, encourage cooperation and compassion. Uh, another uh, area that's, I, I think, very important is uh, tools that help us solve problems more creatively. And so, 
um, you know, we're facing a lot of social problems around the world today. You know, the energy crisis is, is clear, a lot of medical problems. We have, you know, uh, rampant disease, at least in the U.S., that I believe partly comes from our diet, and that partly comes from not understanding what's really important and what's not. Um, if we had intelligent systems that could, say, model the human body, and um, you could actually see the effect of changing your diet, have um, things which monitor your own body and uh, help you decide what vitamins should you be taking, what food sh should you be eating, and what are the consequences of, of you know, living in different ways, that that could have a dramatic effect in helping people um, to live more healthily and to make choices which are more aligned with what they actually care about. Um, and so I see a whole broad range of technologies, technologies to help aggregate. Um, uh, you have groups of people that need to make decisions, um, you know, not too distant future. The whole of humanity is going to have to decide, you know, how should we best integrate these, these technologies? How do you make those kinds of decisions? The tools we have for aggregating opinion today are very crude. You can vote, you can take polls, you know, you get to pick one of three multiple choice, you know, options. That's a really crude uh, representation of what you really think about and care about. So I would love to see a much more semantic way of aggregating the knowledge of a group of people. And so we're developing some technologies for that. Um, so I see a whole range of intelligent tools that will help people uh, go through this process of the unfolding of more powerful technology uh, in a more effective way. Um, I really like, uh, you know, the modern cell phones. I think uh, those are extremely useful. They're, you know, they still aren't quite where, where I would like them to be, but the fact that you have a little, G, you know, unit with GPS in your pocket and you can tell exactly where you are and how to get to where you want to go and uh, you can communicate with your friends, you can look things up on the web. I mean, that's a wonderful technology. I think is, you know, very life enhancing and, you know, uh, Apple is becoming the, the biggest uh, company in the U.S. Uh, for I think they were for a short, short time a few weeks ago um, because they're meeting a human need in a very elegant, aesthetic and very life-serving way. I think adding more intelligence could be very helpful. Uh, I mean, just the process of flying from uh, the U.S. to here, there are all sorts of questions that came up in the airport, you know, is this parking lot free? Which gate is my plane leaving from? Um, you know, where should I take my baggage? All those kinds of questions which somebody knew the answer to, but I didn't. And um, I would have loved to have an assistant which sort of understood the systems that I was interfacing with, understood my personal needs, and helped guide me through it so that I didn't have to, to, you know, struggle with that. So I think adding even just a little bit more intelligence can make a big difference in, uh, in, the, in the current tools that we have. I also think, um, here's a somewhat controversial area, I think there are going to be cameras everywhere. That I think public space will be, for the most part, recorded. Um, that, you know, raises the ire, ire of uh, people who have privacy as a very high concern. Um, but I, th I think it'll have positive consequences. It, it, it basically will mean the kinds of crimes that occur more in the U.S. than here. I, it seems like crime is not such a big issue in, in Australia. Um, you know, I re read stories about um, robberies taking place and they have only sketchy descriptions of, you know, uh, of the criminal. Well, in a world in which uh, things are videotaped, there's no question. Um, it will lead to greater accountability. Um, which I think ultimately will be a good thing. Um, it will also mean that um, the environment around us will be better adapted to our needs. You know, if you uh, have eat a certain kind of a diet, um, your systems should be able to tell you. you. You're hungry for lunch, it'll tell you what restaurants can serve, you know, the, the kinds of food that you, you like. It can help you find that more easily. Um, you need to buy a product instead of, you know, racing around to different stores trying to see if anybody has it. Um, be able to find the closest store at the best price, that kind of thing. So I think economic transactions are going to change uh, dramatically as we have smart agents which are doing a lot of the, the searching and negotiating for us. Um, I think it'll make those kinds of things happen much more smoothly and so it'll, it'll allow humans to focus on the things which are actually most meaningful to us rather than spending a lot of time dealing with kind of bureaucratic details.